First thing on the agenda is the approval of the agenda, and then we do have an addition. Mr. Chair, I'll make a motion to approve the agenda with the addition of the fee payment for the Clay County Substance Use Crisis Center. Okay, we've got a motion. I'll second. Second by Paul. Any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Mr. Chair, maybe just one discussion component. I know usually this board doesn't um, entertain the addition of an agenda piece for fee payments like that, but because there's some substantial savings that would occur if we were to do so, that's why we felt it would be appropriate. Okay. We'll add that right after they are. They are on the agenda already, so we'll just move that in with their other item. Next thing we've got citizens to be heard. Any citizens to be heard? I don't see anybody out there. Anybody on the line? <clears throat> Nothing, Mr. Chair. Okay. Approval of payment of bills and vouchers. I would so move. Okay, we got a motion by Paul. Second. Second by Kevin. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Approval of the minutes from February the 14th. Move approval. Second. And a motion by Kevin, second by Jenny. All in favor? Aye. Okay. And I guess today we are minus Dave. I think he's vacationing somewhere. Where is it? Portugal or somewhere? Well, I hope he's enjoying it. Okay, we got our annual update from West Central Region Tribal Detention Center. Jim. Take care of that one. Mr. Chair, members of the board, I am here today to present the annual update from 2022 um, for the West Central Regional Juvenile Center. I just put together a short little PowerPoint. It's nothing significant. It's just some, something to have in the background, I guess, though. Um, so the West Central Regional Juvenile Center, kind of 10,000-foot view. Um, a juvenile center inside of a county it is unique. Not every county has one. Um, Clay County has a secure, non-secure program. Um, the secure program is part of a collaborative agreement with 11 other counties or 10 other counties. Um, and that's um, the huge grand scheme of things. Um, there's two different um, facilities in each one. Actually, I just want to touch on that picture real quick, um, the gym floor. Looks beautiful there. Um, it needs to be remodeled though. And we do have some, uh, we need, do need a new gym floor and there should be some money in our 2022 budget that I'm gonna ask our advisory board first and then come to you guys to see if we can figure out if we can get the gym floor looking like that again. But I digress. Um, uh, overview of the West Central Regional Juvenile Center. There's two, um, main license. We're licensed by the Minnesota Department of Corrections. Um, and there's two licenses, a secure license and a non-secure license. Underneath each license, there's two different programs. So underneath secure, we have secure detention, which is like your predisposition. So that would be like your, um, your jail um, type of thing. Well, not really jail. The kids still go to school and everything. It's just that these youth haven't been convicted of anything yet. Um, or they're awaiting trial or they're awaiting something. The other one is secure residential where they're um, sentenced to us for a treatment period. Um, and that can be different, vary for every individual youth different. Um, and those would be a, your longer term youth, probably usually about three to four to five months sometimes. Um, then in our non-secure program, um, we have an emergency, which is either short, short term for social services or law enforcement, they picked a youth up. There's not a real serious delinquency or there's just nowhere for this youth to go. It's late at night. Um, they need someplace safe to place that youth and then social services can take them in the morning um, and do something with them in the morning, whatever the case is. Um, stabilization is something we started um, last year with the influx of uh, Youth with significant behavioral issues, um, violent and aggressive, um, with no criminal charges um, and no 
no place is willing to take them. The goal of the stabilization program is to um, get the youth um, in, in a space where they can um, show appropriate behaviors um, and move on to another home, um, maybe back home, et cetera. Evaluate, evaluation is another thing where we bring in doctors, um, various different specialties um, from the community in, um, therapists, and decide an overall output. So the evaluations are usually ordered by a court, say, okay, well, you know, we've had a youth that has had lots of trouble, um, and the courts say, okay, well, let's just, let's figure out a place, the best place for him. What, what, what are the mental health issues that this kid has? What are the behavioral health issues this kid has? What do the professionals recommend for an appropriate placement for this kid? Um, if it's home, what community services should we bring in, et cetera? Um, and then just specialized specific, these things can, um, needs vary, everybody's different. Um, the CLIPS program, again, that's our, our transitional program um, that um, we started four years ago. Um, all right, so staffing at the West Central. Um, in Secure, we have 50 in full-time, I mean, sorry, in non-Secure, our non-Secure program, we have 50 in full-time staff. Um, in Secure, we have 26, and then there's four staff, um, myself, Danell, um, Josh and Ryan that work out of the office. We're not really tied to any specific unit, um, but we're kind of split between our duties, you know, 67, 33. 67% um, of my work is for secure, 33 is for non-secure. So a total of 45 full-time staff. Um, variable hour staff, we rely on variable hour staff pretty heavily for our operation. The model we run, um, it works pretty good. Um, Right now we have 45 variable hour staff. Variable hour is similar to part-time um, and 21 in our non-secure. Um, so right now we up that their pay from 18 to 20, $20, a little over $20 here last couple months ago. And that really helped us to get to where we are now. Before we were like 15 down and now we're, we're right in the ballpark where we need to be. So. Um, the variable hour staff is, is critical for us because again, every individual's kids' needs are different that come in. And having the flexibility of the variable hour allows us to provide that one-on-one -on -one at various different times of the day, whether it's evenings, weekends, mornings, um, assistance in school, et cetera. Um, it allows us to, to flex that around, whereas full-time staff are kind of rigid in a 40-hour work week, we can, pull these individuals around to, to help fill in gaps all over that that come up as, as our staff move around throughout the day and throughout the week. All right. So again, I'm keeping hammering on this individual thing. You see in our mission statement, each individual are recognized. Um, I think it's, it's important. Um, there, there is a stigma that people look at in society when people that need services like ours, um, but however it's not, um, you know, we all have friends and family, um, I had friends and family that went through the Bemidji program because I've come from Roseau County, um, spent some time, I never spent some time, but I had some friends and family spent some time in Roseau County Jail and Clay County Jail, so um, we, all, we all have friends, loved ones that that need services and people do need these services. Um, so it, it's important that every individual um, is, um, is recognized. So when is juvenile center secure is necessary when odd home placement is necessary and the youth has committed a crime that would be, um, they'd be in jail if they were an adult. Um, Non-secure is for, can be for delinquent and non-delinquent um, youth that just need odd home placement that something isn't right, something isn't working. It could be a variety of different reasons. Um, so that's why we're here. Um, what we provide is a whole slew of services inside of uh, the facility in, in our secure and non -secure. One of our biggest partners is Mord Public Schools. Um, that's massive for us. Mord Public Schools is, is absolutely amazing. Um, they have the ability to come in and they can individualize also and when it comes to IEPs, 
um, which is individual education plans, which about half of our youth end up on at some point in time, and those get pretty complex. Um, the school comes in with all the resources and, and provides that and gets that individual where they're at. GED is another big one for us. Unfortunately, we got a lot of youth that are 17, 18 that only have one or two credits. Um, but if they're gonna be with us for three or four months, we might be able to get them a GED. Um, so we can do some GED programming. Um, again, cognitive behavioral is kind of an overall blanket approach that our staff use with our youth in all of our daily interactions. Interventions means our thinking controls our behavior. Um, and that's, that's true for about 90%. There are some that that doesn't work for. Again, and maybe I'll discuss that in a little bit too. Um, but we offer a group and individual counseling um, that can be professional and non-professional. It can be licensed. We have licensed therapists that come in all the time that, that do certain programming. Um, religious services, um, chemical dependency, again with a licensed chemical dependency counselor. Um, trauma therapy, um, you look at what, how, how to address um, mental illness and stuff. And trauma therapy is a big one, um, again, but you know, therapy itself isn't, doesn't always necessarily work for everybody. Um, and we've seen that in trauma therapy is very effective, but um, EMDR is another one. Um, that's a service that some of our therapists have been trained in um, that's, that's worked um, very well um, for PTSD type of stuff. Um, it's proven to be effective, more so with the males from what I see in, in, in the veteran community too. Um, and then there's DBT therapy um, that primarily, not all the time, but works primarily better with the female populations, um, youth with um, borderline personality disorder and, and, and the such. Um, community service opportunities and transitional services, whatever they need, trying to get them to where they need to go. So going into just our secure itself, just our secure program, looking at our secure program. Um, we have 11 member counties. They are Becker, Cass, Clay, Douglas, Grant, Ottertail, Stephen, <coughs> Todd, Travers, Wadena, and Wilkin. Um, again, thankfully every county doesn't need a juvenile detention center and that it's a small portion of our population, but it, it is needed nonetheless. And the 11 member counties got together um, way before I was around, but in 2018 also, then they re-solidified it again for another 20 years. Um, and that's proven to be very, very successful um, that none of our member counties are in crisis like they are in most places around the state when it comes to juveniles. If you look at our population, 33 different counties um, used our services um, in 2022 um, and more have requested. We, we, don't, we don't accept everybody. Um, I'll kind of show you just kind of an outline. Um, the secure portion of the facility um, can hold up to about 60 youth. Um, right now we're licensed to 55, but staffing levels, we keep it where we can staff between 30 and 40 really easily, and we can be very effective in that programming in there. And we're, we're not warehousing kids. You see that top line, that's where our average daily population rests. Um, and then we have our member and our non-member. And you can see that when our member needs pick up, we slowly taper off with our, with our non-members. And when our, when our members' needs drop, we, we, we pick up our non-members. So we're utilizing our resources very effectively in that sense. Um, and we're, we're maintaining our equilibrium where we're effective. Um, um, some secure trends in the, in the last year, and it's been happening. There's less and youth, less youth per capita placed in secure. Um, so, you know, overall, um, you know, per capita, um, less and less. Um, youth in detention act out way more violently. Um, the violence, mental health, um, willingness to just outright assault people um, has, has gone up significantly. That's... Um, <coughs> That's concerning. Um, the youth that we do get in placement now have way more significant histories. Um, I remember 10 years ago that it would be 
Um, we would be sometimes their first treatment. Now, now they've had lots of programming um, and before they hit us. Um, and then, you know, we're at the place where no hospitals or mental health facilities will take the youth. And that's a touchy subject. That's where the whole problem is in the state of Minnesota right now is if, um, you know, you have your cabs in Wilmer, which is a scare hospital. Um, it's licensed for 16. Um, they average three kids a day there. Um, they don't take youth. Um, again, it's, 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 a, it's a state issue um, that the hospitals, I, I don't know what, overregulation, whatever it is, the hospitals aren't willing to accept our youth that have significant mental health issues. Um, so, yeah, they, there's a shortage of staff everywhere, um, but I'd say the shortage of staff isn't in the, the professionals, the ones that are willing to give advice. It's that we have a shortage of staff as the people that actually work in the units with the kids making a difference. That's where that's where it's hard to find the staff. Um, there's always people willing to give advice and tell what should happen and what shouldn't happen, but unfortunately, the state hasn't been able to figure out how to get people into those roles. Um, so that's where we're at. That's a huge concern. Um, and the mental illness thing, it's a huge buzzword in the correctional field. Um, is it mental illness that's driving the behavior? Is it a mixture? And it's always a combination of both. Um, so it's hit and miss. One thing I do like to, to talk about a little bit, though, when it comes to um, secure placements, um, and again, this is this is kind of an overall. So when you generalize, um, you're not hitting the, the big point. But overall, a huge chunk of our of our youth that end up in our facility and end up repeatedly in our facility have very traumatic backgrounds. Um, they've had a lot of um, traumas in their backgrounds. One of the things to rate trauma is the ACE, everybody's familiar with that. Um, but the prevalence of ACE um, indicators by youth that are placed in juvenile detention centers are significantly higher. So I like to point out two things with this all the time. So I always like to point out that placing a youth out of home is traumatic of itself. Um, removing a kid from a loved one, um, an alleged loved one, um, whatever it is, um, can be traumatic. However, sometimes placing a kid out of home can actually relieve them from a lot of these traumas that they're facing in the homes and in the communities. So I think that piece is very important. That piece isn't talked about enough because the youth that we see, um, it's kind of angersome, bothersome for me that when you read their history and it's like, why? Why did it take so long? But um, there is there is reasons behind that because you know in the past people have abused that and, and moved kids at home when they probably shouldn't have. So it's it's very very tough. It's not an easy it's not an easy fix, um, but it's a battle we're all fighting nonetheless. Clay County's fight into this is Clay County's increased trauma therapy in the juvenile centers. There's lots of different therapies. So when you talk about what needs to address mental health. Um, we're addressing the mental health in the facility. It might not be a hospital type setting. It might not be a home based setting, but it's a secure setting and it's necessary to be a secure setting based on their behaviors. But we are bringing in those professionals to give them that help that they need. Med management, that's, that's a huge one. Um, that's very hard to find. We have a, ther um, a doctor that'll come in once a week, um, see youth. Um, and prescribe medications um, and, you know, with parental input um, as required and, and all that. But it's very complex. And, and the meds that are prescribed for psychiatric reasons, they're, they're pretty complex. So it's, they have, there's like a, doctors that specialize in it. So um, family practitioners just won't prescribe some of the medications like this doctor would. Um, we just do assessments. Um, or, um, yeah. Um, I'll just kind of wrap up here, kind of bring it into non secure. Non secure is a, that's a Clay County program. Again, um, I see Rhonda's looking to put together the uh, auto home placement committee again. I seen the email um, last night with um, chair. Um, 
2017, um, they had the Auto Home Placement Committee that um, that kind of helped develop what programs we have right now over at the Juvenile Center. Um, and there's been a lot of changes and there's juvenile programming, um, secure and non-secure. It, it, it is in crisis in the state of Minnesota. Um, Clay County is not seeing that crisis um, based on the work that the people in that committee did back in 2017 to get us where we are now. We're starting to see some more changes. Um, so we're looking forward to that committee getting back together again and, and thinking to keep Clay County out of the red that everybody else is in that's, you know, could possibly be coming. Um, but the non-secure is physically designed for short-term emergency placement. Um, right now we're seeing youth that are staying for longer periods of time. Um, very complex programming needs for these youth. Um, again, when I go back to cognitive behavioral programming, again, that's, that's like the key when you talk about correctional programming, evidence-based practices. That's fine, but when you get youth that get on the autism spectrum or a spectrum similar to that, the cognitive behavioral approach is not appropriate and we have to switch up our approaches. Um, so that takes staff training and, you know, and, and just how to identify and work with each individual youth for their behaviors. Um, higher level of need for one-on-one um, -on -one in those programs. Um, they act out very violently. Um, and that's where we're at with that. Um, that don't for questions. How many, how many people have you got in the, in your? In there today? Yeah. Um, I would say probably 62 youth between both programs. That's combined. Combined, yes. <clears throat> What is the cost? What, is, what, what do we pay for foster homes or something like that? We put them into a home. Is there different rates or is there? I have no idea what the foster home rates and pay are. Yeah, that's a Rhonda question. Yeah. Oh, okay. I mean, you put some people into, I mean, some kids into homes at all, or you all, you have them all just in your place? We have them all just in our place. Um, what we do is we work with the county and social services to try to get them into homes. So if okay. the homes refuse them, and that's one of one of the things we do with like our stabilization programs, the homes or the um, corporate foster cares, whatever it is, are saying, well, no, they're too violent. Well, we'll work with them on that violence thing, a stable pattern of behavior, and they'll say, okay, well, we'll take them back again. So that's what we. So that's around this program. All right. Yep. Very good. Any questions? Yeah, Paul. Yeah, uh, James, I so appreciate the tour I got a couple months with you, uh, ago and, and seeing some of the detail of this, it really helped. Um, I, I was so impressed, especially by the, as you kind of smiled about when you were even uh, talking, uh, how working with more ed school systems, seeing that education piece, and then um, I forgot the acronym already, but your, your uh, program at the end to get people back in the wor workforce. What's that called again? The CLIPS program. Thank you. And the um, question I have is on the uh, non-secure. Uh, maybe I can get something here. Uh, that's a Clay County program. Uh, how did that get initiated? And has that been around for many, many years? Or is that relatively new? Just a little background for me, if you don't mind. And then uh, last, um, on the non-secure, I'm assuming uh, referral brings them in, um, other things, but is there, are there times that um, it's simply an agreement between the child and the parents, or does it normally work through some social system? A again, if they haven't committed any crimes. Okay. So if I could tackle the second one sure. first, and then yeah. I'd yield to um, <laughs> okay. or sure. Eve on the history of the non-secure program. Um, but the second one, um, usually it's got to be a professional placement. So sometimes there's things called voluntary placement agreements, but that's an agreement between social services, um, the parents and the family um, to place. So then we can get a youth that, that's placed in a voluntary placement, but again, the courts are already involved. So um, a parent can't show up and say, will you take my kid? Okay. Um, that does happen, um, but what we have to do is we just, it's its simple, it, they, well, it's not simple, it's very complex and traumatic, it's kind of, you know, 
the child now is basically abandoned, call law enforcement. Um, law enforcement will sign them in on a 36-hour hold or 72-hour hold for our non-secure. Then they'll kick it over to social services. The social services will get in contact with us either that day within an hour or if it's at night, then the next morning. Um, and then they'll work it out from there and then they'll go through that process for the non-delinquency type of things. Okay. Um, well, thank you. The Appreciate history. all the work you're doing. Um, Commissioner Kravina, in terms of, of how long it's been in existence, it's, it's been around, around a long time. I, I don't have the date, I don't know if Steve even does, but. 1997. And there you go, okay, 1997. In, yeah, in a lot of that, you know, there's a variety of, of things that go on and, you know, you can have a situation where it can, um, you know, there's, there's no f fault of what, of anything that the child has done, but this, but the circumstances are that that's the healthiest place for them to be on a temporary basis, you know, so, um, yeah, but I, I don't know if that answers your question. Um, I, if, if I could, I, um, you know, you talked about um, your staff and the needing to recognize all of these different potential issues that each individual in your facility might have. It's pretty remarkable that they can even, you know, you, you mentioned there's some on the autism spectrum and, and there can be a number of other things and, and they all need to have a different type of of, uh, of of assistance in terms of you know um, professional care, um, so I, I I guess I'm I think that's pretty remarkable that I mean I and the fact that you're in constant training on that I think is a good thing. Um, you don't have medical staff there 24/7, do you? No. Nope. Yeah. Yeah. But if I can just switch focus a little bit to something that you've talked to us not too long ago about was the DRTs. Uh, and I know there was some previous legislation that was being considered that uh, we as a county really, you know, and, and your centers across the state really had concerns about, uh, based on current legislation, do you know of anything that's up right now that's being talked about? And for maybe for Paul, for your behalf, DRTs, it's, it's basically a dis disciplinary room time. It's something that, that's incorporated in our facility for the protection of staff and other, and other kids when you have somebody who breaks out into a, a bad behavior, for lack of a better term. And so they're, you know, in that case, they're, they're kind of restricted to their room for a period of time. And there's been some legislation that says that they don't think that should be done. And I guess that's summarizing it. Um, and, I, and I know that nothing ever did come of that proposed legislation. Is there anything that you know of now? Um, House file 1233 um, is gonna be in discussion on Thursday in a committee hearing. Um, and that's pretty close to the same language. Um, um, as far as, as where it's at, it, it's, it was weird last legislative session because we had no contact with anybody. Um, this legislative session, we've had contact with um, the Department of Corrections and even the Commissioner of Corrections um, and, and discussed that. Again, the term disciplinary room time, like, so the trouble with legislation is, is the proposed legislation is to the commissioner can't grant a license to anybody unless they ban disciplinary room time. The problem is, is our licensing rule, which is our law that has it, lists disciplinary room time as the process that we must use and then the due process behind that. Um, and for youth that, you know, assault somebody, youth that um, threaten somebody, um, in order to put them in a room by themselves for, again, a short period of time, it's reviewed every eight hours. Um, and if there's not a need, we bring them back in. Um, but the thing is, is eliminating DRT is confusing in of itself because then your licensing rule, it says you use disciplinary room time for these things. Then it says, well, what are you supposed to use then? 
Um, how are you supposed to, what is the due process? What are the rights of this individual? If I am gonna take them away, and now they're saying I can't use due process, but you know, a kid just beat up another kid or a kid's threatening to harm another kid. I, you know, again, we're, we wanna have a, a, a safe environment where kids can learn. Um, and so harassment and stuff is not gonna be tolerated. Um, so that's, that's stuff that needs to be addressed. Um, but the Department of Corrections on this one, um, they said they wanted to go into rulemaking um, and change it. Um, so I, I, I don't quite know the way it's gonna go, but I know on Thursday, um, after this committee hearing, I imagine the, the Commissioner for Corrections would um, be testifying one way or another to give direction, because again, the, the DOC themselves, they run um, a facility in Red Wing, um, so. Right, it, you know, and I've read some stories based on some reports that were done by a media outlet out of the cities, and, and they described DRTs in several different ways, and one of them was with that they, they basically described it as these facilities with, with throw a kid in a, a locked room with no contact at all, and they'd basically serve them their food through a little tray in the door, and, and they wouldn't have any contact for days or weeks or months on end, and that just simply doesn't happen in our facility. No, not even close. Yeah, so so I, you know, so there's a wide variety of different um, opinions and maybe th thoughts and ideas on what goes on in these facilities, but I, I think, but I think it's important for the safety of our staff and the safety of the kids in there that there has to be some form of this. Of, wouldn't you agree on the DRTs? Mr. Chair, Commissioner, yes, um, most definitely. Um, you, we have the youth that are the most violent out of, let's just say our region, 10, 11 members. We get our youth that act out the most violently. We, we put them in kind of an area together to manage behaviors. Um, and if we're not able to, at times, enforce safety and security, such as threatening behaviors and or physical assaults. Um, you can see how a learning therapeutic, you see how therapy won't work very good, trauma therapy won't work very good if they're constantly in an environment that is not managed by staff um, in a pro-social way. Um, I well, think that's- I, I guess on that, you know, that was just something that was a real concern of us and, and our 11 member group. Uh, but I, hopefully you can kind of keep us informed if there is anything that that would be of concern that that you let us know that we can uh, try to be involved if we can to help at least if there's a language issue that needs to be <clears throat> dealt with within the language you know most definitely I will um, the, the other one is the there's the uh, JDAI screening tool again we made moves a couple years ago that if that goes through, we can handle that no problem. Um, and then the, the other one, that sick, safe, sick and safe thing, um, if that goes through, um, it'll be about 35,000 for liabilities for just my staffing costs. Yeah, and I, I guess I would prepare, prepare for that and maybe be ready to give a presentation on that to the 11 member group when we, is it April we're meeting? April. Yeah. Great. Thank you. That's... Any other questions? <clears throat> Thanks for your work. Thank okay, you. Yeah, I, I just like to thank my staff. Um, they're they're the ones out there dealing with a lot of uh, a lot of issues day to day, and um, you know it's we try to provide our staff are very humanizing. Um, they care about the kids. Um, they treat them, each individual, as how they do that is, um, it's a basic, simple rule of thumb. Treat them as like they were your kid or your brother or your sister. Um, and what do you think is appropriate for them and, and follow through with things you say you're supposed to do, et cetera. Well, that's good to hear. Thank you very much for your presentation. Then. Thank you. <clears throat> Okay, next we've got an update from the Solo Waste Department. Corey. Good morning, thank you. <coughs> <coughs> I broke my presentation down into basically areas within the Solid Waste Department, either locations or services offered. 
Um, I'll start with the landfill. The landfill expansion project has reached substantial completion. Um, we still have a final bill that we're working on, but we should have that within the last week or within the next week. Um, we've entered the one year warranty phase. So that is all up and ready to go. Uh, the project included a new cell, addition of the public drop off area and a methane boiler, which is being used to heat the building that is shared with the highway department at this time. Um, those all seem to be working very well as well as the flares. So things are up and running good there. Uh, leachate in 2022, we hauled 2.8 million gallons of leachate to Fargo at a cost of $196,000. Uh, I'm currently working out a deal with Pelican Rapids where we possibly could haul some, if not all, of our leachate there. Um, if that deal works out, uh, based on last year's numbers or 2022's volume, we would save roughly $84,000 next year. Um, we have taken some test loads there. The test loads all look good. We are going to do a six-month trial period with them. Um, we're working on the contract now. We would hope that would start April 1st. Um, running six months, if that goes well, we would sign a longer term contract with them. In the meantime, we'll still take some loads to Fargo to keep our relationship with Fargo. Um, staff at the landfill, I'm thankful to say we are fully staffed at this time. Uh, the staff includes landfill manager, two equipment operators, two truck drivers, and as we get closer to the summer, we will be hiring two roster employees to help us upkeep the grounds. Um, Along with being fully staffed, when I started, one of my goals was to have everybody cross-trained. Um, as we know, every, people are gone once in a while with COVID, cancer, um, several other reasons. So having people cross-trained was a high priority for me. And at this time, all the, la all the landfill staff are cross-trained so that if any one of them's gone, we can keep moving without a hitch. So um, the two new drivers are amazing. They, they basically came in and just took over and they're doing it all on their own and I couldn't ask for better help out there. So, uh, The volume at the landfill, last year we took in nearly 1,500 tires, 478 appliances, and that would be microwaves, washers, dryers, refrigerators, freezers, things like that. Uh, 49,287.85 tons of solid waste. And if you do the gorilla math like I did on my computer, that it works out to 23 tons per hour that we were open. So we're, we're covering a lot of trash out there. Uh, one concern for the landfill is PFAS. Uh, we've discussed it before at this meeting, um, or at these meetings. PFAS is basically something that's a contaminant. It's everywhere. Um, it's been found in Alaskan rivers that are untouched. So it's, it's in the air and it's out there. But um, we are going to start testing for it. Uh, the Landfill coalition, coalition has a tentative program set up that we are thinking about joining or I would like to join. Um, I've consulted Stantec on this and they agree. The rationale for joining in the study is simply strength in numbers. Uh, if we have all the landfills involved, the MPCA doesn't have as much power as if it's just me by myself. Um, as well as it eliminates or lowers the costs and eliminates the number of testing that we can be done. So we have a couple more meetings to go on that, but we've got a tentative agreement with the MPCA on, on how we want to run that, that testing program. So um, one other reason I don't want to do it on my own is I don't want to be forced into somebody else's plan. I want to be part of the prop, part of the solution rather than just taking what somebody else has given us. So that's it for the landfill. As far as recycling and household hazardous waste, we have a current staff of a recycling coordinator and a household hazardous waste coordinator with one roster position. We are looking for an additional roster position in both areas. So if you know of anybody who's looking for a part-time job, we will take them. Uh, recycling, overall recycling collected in, by Minn Kota was down 4% last year. Um, newspapers and magazines were down 40%. That's just the trend. Nobody reads the paper anymore. They all read it online or their iPads. So um, I, see, I see that number getting bigger in the future. Uh, mixed paper and commingle were up for the year. Um, as of tomorrow, glass will no longer be accepted in commingle. Um, that's basically area-wide, Fargo, West Fargo, uh, and Clay County. The reason for that is it contaminates all of our other recyclables, and it makes them harder to market. So they are just, they're going to eliminate the glass in the commingle, and you'll have to bring it to a single sort. Um, we're working on where we're going to get rid of it at this point. Hopefully, 
we can reuse it for something somewhere. So we're working on it. Um, one side note with the glass coming out, that's going to make our numbers look horrible last year or next year because glass is the heaviest product. So our volume will be way down just based on weight. So give you a heads up for next year. Um, household hazardous waste. We serviced 2,188 households last year. Of those, 1,803 had household hazardous waste. 385 had universal waste, which is oil, antifreeze, et cetera, that it's not considered hazardous, but it can't be just thrown in the garbage. So. Um, we collected 93,399 pounds of household hazardous waste, and it was disposed of properly. And 6,035 pounds of waste was exchanged to our reuse room and our reuse program. So the national average is between 30 to 40 pounds of household hazardous waste per household. Clay County's average is 43 pounds per household. So we're actually above the, the national average on that. So. Uh, Perham, we ended up the year short approximately 90 loads to Perham due to driver shortage and me being out for a while. Uh, with the new RRC opening up, we are slowly gaining that volume back. Um, our new equipment allows us to haul roughly an extra 5,000 pounds per load, which if you do the math works out to approximately two extra loads per week. So Brian is still giving us our 10 loads, but we're actually hauling the equivalent of 12. So we're, we're making those loads up in, in pretty short order. So um, other than that, Perum is running well. They are doing you know, an awesome job of keeping things going. One concern they have is um, moisture in their loads and that's not something that concerns us because ours sit on the floor and dry out so we've never had a load rejected and I don't foresee us ever having a load rejected there because ours are pretty dry and good good fuel so and the RRC we opened up February 6th uh, with minimal hiccups a few heart attacks here and there but no uh, that sounds serious <laughs> Yeah, the Friday night before we opened, I pulled the truck in to do a trial load and it wouldn't fit in the pit. Uh, the sprinkler pipes were about eight inches too low. So that was Friday at three. And by Monday at seven, the guy was there to drop the pipes and we were loading trucks by 7.15. So hats off to those guys for coming in early and bailing me out because I was having a heart attack. But um, other than that, we have just a few minor issues. Things, doors going up and down on their own periodically. We're working on that. A couple pipes froze. We're working on that. But um, as far as the overall flow and how things are going, it's going really well. So um, at the RSC, we have all of our recycling staff, all of our household hazardous waste, and we have two people that are dedicated to the RSC. One is a drop-off attendant, and one is a scale house attendant. Uh, come summer, we'll be looking for one rostered help just to, to help with the volume. So. And in closing, I would like to thank my staff. The last six months, they, uh, they've they been amazing. They uh, made it possible for me to be gone when I needed to be out for treatments. And uh, without them, it would have been really tough. So they knew what to show me and what not to show me while I was gone. So um, some of the things I came back to that were taken care of, it was just amazing. And I'd also like to thank you guys for the last six months for all the support you've given me too while I was out and, and getting this thing up and running. So with that, I'll yield to questions. Questions? Well, I just, Corey, to come on board in the middle of a project and really take on as much as you did and, and dealing with personal issues as well, boy, you have just done a great job. I appreciate the fact that you're seeking out an option for leachate uh, to potentially see some substantial savings and um, just thanks for the work that you're doing. And I agree, your crew is, is a bunch of rock stars as well. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it's great to hear that it's going well out there, so uh, keep that good work up. Neil? Well, thank you for the update then, uh, Corey. And, uh, I bet. All right. I guess the next item concerns you too, so uh, we'll go right into that. All right. Uh, with the new opening new building, we had some plans that obviously didn't go quite as we had hoped, so... Um, one of the issues that's come up is we were going to retrofit our old garbage trailer to fit in the hole. Um, we still can do that. The issue is that our old trailer is 40 feet long and the new the hole is 53 feet long. And we found out that 
when you dump garbage over the edge into a trailer with a hole, you end up with a lot downstairs that you have to clean up. Um, and aside from that, we could only haul a, a tremendous less volume in the, in the smaller trailers. So um, I'm here today to request that we can use what's left over of our funds or some of the funds are left over for the project to purchase a new trailer. Um, I would sell the old trailer. The price range I've been given on it is somewhere between forty to sixty thousand dollars I could get for it. Obviously, I'm going to ask sixty, but I don't think I'll get that. Mm -hmm. um, we had funds available in the budget of nine thousand eight hundred and thirty-eight dollars to retrofit our old trailer, which we won't need anymore. Uh, the new trailer would cost one hundred and six thousand four fourteen, one hundred and twenty-four dollars in license fee. So the total cost of the new trailer would be somewhere between thirty-six. Thousand seven hundred and fifty-six thousand seven hundred. Um, we're going to need the third trailer when summer rolls around. Right now, we're rotating through two, um, and it's going very well. But when the volume picks up in the summer, we can have a loaded truck, so the drivers come back and just jump from one truck to the other, and they keep going, keep the flow going. Um, so the third trailer is essential. Uh, I'm just requesting that we can get the bigger one that works a little bit <coughs> for our needs. And along with that, we realized that we need a skid steer. Uh, the cost of a new skid steer is $46,829.20 per the bid from RDO. Um, so the total purchase price that I'm asking for today is somewhere between $83,529.20 and $103,529.20. Uh, that would relieve us with the remaining fund balance somewhere between $140,000 and $160,000 to cover any costs that come up in the future for the RRC. Any questions on that? So you've got one 40-foot trailer now, or you got- I've got two 53-footers, and then the old trailer we had was a 40-footer. Okay, you want to get a third, the third yep. one now? Yeah. Fit it to 53, okay. Yep. And we would sell the old one just, rather than retrofit it to make it work, we would sell the old ones. Okay. So you're looking for a trailer and for a skid steer? Yes. Mr. Chair. Yes. Maybe if I can expand a little bit on where the where the dollars are coming from for this. The um, right now the report that we got from Lori showed a cash remaining of, of about three hundred and sixty four thousand uh, dollars. That included um, a remaining owner contingency that is unspent. I think that number is around forty five thousand. So. Uh, there's there's there are still some issues that are going to have to be that are going to have to come out of those dollars, uh, and they include uh, the winter conditions that were that we had talked about before. Uh, there's a sidewalk that still needs to be done. There's some change in light controls for the in that project, uh, as well as some concrete testing. So when you subtract those. Um, those numbers out, you have about 245,000 left. And so if we, you know, if we take this up to 103,000 out, then we're, we'd probably be down to roughly 140,000. That would still be within our, uh, the revenues that we had anticipated to come in for this project. <laughs> So basically everything that we've gotten from construction engineers, we've incorporated in into this to come up with these numbers. So it certainly is doable. I don't know what else is unexpected come out by springtime, but you know, hopefully the 140,000 that would remain would be enough to handle all those things. So, so and it's certainly, um, you know, when you look out there and you think, you, the magnitude of that property out there and the, the idea that the skid steer, I think, is really good. Uh, when you think about if there is something that needs to be done right at opening or something like that, not always are we going to be able to have a contractor be there or Joe be there or something. So this allows them some, some room to, to do that. And in terms of the trailer, you know, there's another, uh, Corey touched a little bit on it since, ever since we started delivering to Purim, we've always been below our uh, we have an 8400 ton um, agreement there and the first 6,000 is a trade so we're paying for 2400 tons a year to go there 
And when you look at that at $135 a ton, you're upwards of about $320,000. And when you're short, uh, in, and at the end of the year, we, and, the, and I, this is no individual's fault, but it, as it just turned out, we had, we had built up to, and a lot of it was because of our driver shortage. We were down under our, our tons by 1,000 tons. And if you do the math, a thousand tons that that we pay for, whether we deliver or not, at one hundred and thirty-five dollars a ton, you know you're looking at one hundred and thirty-five thousand dollars just in in just in that cost because we weren't able to deliver what we're paying for anyway. So this new trailer that you know that's another option for us to be able to make sure that we always have the availability to to deliver those tons so it's it's a smart investment uh, and I'm, I'm glad that Corey was on top of that and that and that uh, again I think if you recall was at our last meeting that Corey came to us regarding the purchase of the additional tractor from the city of Moorhead so we'll have tractors to go with all these trailers now too so it, it just makes sense to do this we have drivers too huh? yes we do yep. yeah. okay. we have three drivers and myself so and with the three trailers, we can rotate through drivers so we can actually get by with two drivers on a day. Um, right now, in the in the slow season, we're having two trucks and one driver's been doing it and been keeping up pretty easily. Okay. Um, so, drivers, knock on wood, should uh, shouldn't be an issue. Uh, one other thing I like to add: the skid steer. We are trying to work out an agreement so that we can share it with the detox when that opens up, also. So it would be you know it would be a future need for them also. So we'd be eliminating that them coming to the board at that point so good idea okay go ahead paul yeah uh commissioner campbell uh, appreciate the comments uh that was really good to kind of get a cash flow to the whole uh, uh system here um uh you said you were going to be back last week and here you are so you kept oh, yeah going. i knew i was coming <laughs> <laughs> um anyway uh a quick question uh the trailer um just from peat farming, I understand all that. But the skidster, a question on that. Um, what's the longevity on something that, or how many hours, or what's the life expectation on a skidster? skidster? And once you get in operational use of it, would you think about a rotation, you know, uh, of keeping it so long, or, you know what I mean, and going into, a, right. you know. Uh, we actually have a skidster at the landfill also. Um, Eventually, I would work on rotating through both of them so we could have, you know, updated in both locations. As far as the lifespan for what we're talking about using it for, I would depreciate it out over probably a 10-year period, and, and I think it would last way longer than that because we're not doing any off-road work or anything like that. It's mostly just snow removal and, and lifting heavier items into the dumpster, hauling tires around, that kind of stuff. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Mr. Chair, if I can follow up on Commissioner Kravitz's question. One of the one of the things in 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 our solid waste department because it was an enter enterprise fund we didn't for quite some time have the same sort of a internal service fund established for all of the equipment and solid waste uh, it was kind of a deal where you plan for you plan for uh, you know like the BOMAG for example is a huge one that's a what are they close to a million dollars now eight hundred and fifty thousand dollars. you know so so now we're we're trying to over the last few years we've tried to been building up and working with Lori on establishing this internal service fund and so your question is good and then it's just so then what happens is we incorporate putting money in each year's annual budget for when it is replaced as opposed to having to pull eight hundred fifty thousand dollars out at once so it's, that's a good comment and the other further comments uh, you, mr. chair maybe Corey if you you provided uh, uh, a price of of the trailer and the fit up uh, if the board were to to entertain a motion could we specifically list that dollar amount versus giving a range of of 30 to 36 to 56 thousand i know the auditor's office is going to want to have that information the new trailer cost is 106,414 um the license is 124 and then there's sales tax on top of that the uh the variable range is based on how much we can get for the used trailer um like i said i was asking 60 i, I I've been told anywhere from forty to sixty thousand dollars. I can sell it today for forty, but I, I think we should be able to get more than that out of it. So um, that's where the range comes in. Is is that twenty thousand dollars, give or take, on that used trailer? 
But the high end of that was 103, right? The high end of what's the high? The end? total purchase price was 103, yeah. correct? Mr. I, I would move approval of the purchase of these two items, giving um, our solid waste director the, um, the ability to negotiate the trade-in value of the trailer on on the price of the new one that's been um, that, that he mentioned here today, and that these purchases come out of remaining project costs for the triple RD, or, or for the uh, recovery center, resource recovery center project. Second the motion, just to clarify though, do we need to have the 103 part of the motion? I'd prefer that. I would incorporate. I so that not only the 103, but then also then the, the actual cost of the. Um, cost of the trailer as well? Well, you've got. And the skid steer? The 103 was a combination. Well, the 103 was, there was one that had the 40,000. The 103 was the trailer, right? 103 is the total between the two? Yes, okay. But so, all right, maybe we need to, so what is the total uh, price of the trailer? The total price of the new trailer is 106,338. All right, so the motion would be to purchase the trailer at 106,338. And allow the, allow uh, Corey then to negotiate the trade-in value of our trailer to bring that down to a net cost of somewhere between thirty-six and fifty-six thousand, right? Correct. Okay. I and, and then the then then the other piece would be then we better also put in there the cost of the skid steer, and that was what forty-six thousand eight twenty-nine twenty. Okay, so that both those numbers are what would be in my motion. And same with my second. Okay, we've got a motion and a second. Uh, to purchase these two items. Uh, any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. Thank you. Get it done. Thanks, Corey. Okay, next thing is the approval of a final contract voucher. Justin, going to handle that one. Yeah, good morning. Hi, so the Justin. first item I have is for the approval for the final contract voucher for CASA 12. So this was a mill and overlay project done this past summer, and it went from the Red River to CASA 11. RJ Zavril and Sons was a contractor, and I thought the project turned out really, really well. And the final amount to be approved today is $2,174,732.50. And the initial bid was $2,229,247.65. So we came in a little under on this one. I'll second that. Or make a motion to approve that, sorry. Second. You got a motion with Jenny, second by Kevin to approve the contract, uh, final contract voucher. Any other discussion on that? And I guess the project number is SAP 14612019. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? All right. So the second item I have is a construction services contract with Ulteg. This is for the turn lane project in Glendon. So Ulteg did the design on this project, so this is a change order to the original design contract. So the LPP funding that we received for this project does cover $30,370.37 of the proposed $74,000, with the remaining being split 50-50 between Glendon and Clay County. That's in accordance with the MOU for the project. And then this was also budgeted into our consulting budget for the year. Um, there's a lot of signal work on this project, so it's really out of our expertise for the construction services that we can do. Yeah. Scarce me when we're already going for extra when we haven't started yet. And this was planned. We just didn't know what the cost would be or the actual year of construction, so that's okay. why it comes in as a change order and not under the original contract. 
So that uh, that contract's been awarded already, though, hasn't it? Yep. This is just with Altag, so with a consulting engineering firm. Okay. There you go. So, Mr. Chair, if I could, so, I mean, I, when you look back, the original amount that we looked at it being thirty thousand, it's at seventy-four. It's almost doubled. Is that? Is that is, is that because it's the a percentage of the so MnDOT awarded covers, contract? Yes, so MnDOT covers eight percent of the original grant amount, and obviously the bid amount was higher. So the seventy-four thousand is just an estimate, not to exceed. So it's just an hourly rate based on what Ulteg thinks that they will spend. I don't anticipate it to be that high, but it'll be an, an hourly rate. Okay, so the. The thirty thousand three seventy that you have in your in your document here, that was the original estimated amount based on the original contract of the price. Product. Correct. Eight percent of the engineer's estimate. Eight percent of the initial because that project came in I <laughs> way over Yep. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And what is the council's wishes? A motion to approve. We've got a motion to approve the cost, uh, additional cost uh, of the contract. I'll second. And we got a second from Paul. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Um, the next item I have is similar to the last one. So this is a change order for the project in Comstock with Olteg. So Ulteg did some additional drainage analysis for the direction of the diversion authority. And this change order also includes construction services for the project through Comstock. So this is, we are the ones who signed the contract, but an, essentially the diversion authority will be paying the cost of this. And the diversion authority has reviewed this and approves of it. Okay. Make a motion to approve the amendment to the on the road to uh, road construction project. Second. Okay, we got a motion and a second to approve the contract. Uh, any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 And then the final item I have is request approval of a resolution for federal raise grant. So Spring Prairie is working on a federal raise grant application and ask for our support through a resolution. This is similar to what we did for the LRIP project a couple years ago that they did, were not successful in getting funding. So this is the township road that is used heavily throughout the year by aggregate producers and the precast concrete facility. It is a gravel road that does not hold up to the traffic it regularly sees and they're requesting, or they are trying to get a grant through the federal government that is actually due today, and they're requesting our support. Mr. Chair, I would make a motion to approve resolution 2023-08. Second. And we've got a motion to approve contract resolution 2023-08. Just a comment. Uh, most of, or actually all of the applications that come before the Planning Commission that have um, these hauling activities like you talk about, the Planning mm. Commission has recommended that they use this road. Part of that is to avoid um, a nuisance to residents up there. So I think anything we can do to find additional funds to deal with uh, reconstruction of that road really is to help with um, the recommendation that we've really made. Mm -hmm. If they get an alternate route uh, assigned to while they're doing the reconstruction, so they sneak out kind of through a north, through a gravel pit, and during road restrictions, when that road is restricted to five tons, they use that road too. So they will go out to the north during the reconstruction project. Okay. Right. There's kind of a back road that they can get through an existing gravel pit. All righty. All right, we got a motion uh, to approve that uh, 23. 08, further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Approved. Thank you. Do we, do we know when they, when they determine who's successful in those raids? I don't. Is there a time frame involved with that? It's, 
typically anywhere from three to six months. It's not a fast turnaround time because it is a very competitive grant. Thank you. Justin, I, Mr. Chair. Justin, I just would like, please, to extend my gratitude to your crew. Uh, the last few weeks have been challenging with a major blizzard blowing in once a week. Uh, the roads in the country, your crew has made an, an attempt to make them as safe as possible for the work week ahead. And so uh, seeing people out there making sure that intersectioners are blown back over the weekend, I really do appreciate that because um, the drifts are enormous. And I saw you must have contracted with Fitzgerald to move some, yep. some drifts back of a, on a road as well. And so I think um, they're doing the best that they can to make sure that they're blowing them back in anticipation of yet another storm. Yeah, it has been a tough couple of weeks. And yeah, our guys have done an awesome job. And we just got word that there is another blizzard warning for tonight. So, so thank you. Yep. I will extend that to them. Thanks also for rescuing my husband who <laughs> drove through a snowdrift and was stalled in the middle of the road. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank Brad you. will love that I said that. Okay. Thank you for your work. We do have a meeting at 1, right? Yep. Okay. Thank you. Okay. All right. With that, we'll go into item number 9, approval to replace a part-time employee. If you're ready, Kathy, and try. I am. Good morning, Mr. Chair and Commissioners. This is a request of a, um, it's already a budgeted position. Um, we've had for um, three years, and the employee is retiring, and so I need to replace. It's a .6 um, public health analyst strategist position. So just requesting replacement of the um, budgeted .6 position. Move approval. A second. We got a motion by Kevin, second by Paul, <clears throat> to approve the hiring of a 0 0.6 part time employee. Any further discussion? <clears throat> Excuse me. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Uh, okay. And then we'll take your agenda item, the addition approval for a fee payment for Clay County substance use crisis. Center plan reviews by the state of Minnesota. Yeah, I apologize for the late agenda item. I was thinking it was coming through on the vouchers, which it is, but um, the explanation of um, there's plan reviews that are required. And if we, if we get this payment in, then the, um, there won't be a delay in um, continuing on our process. It's two, or it's three plan reviews, excuse me, the Department of Labor for 29,560 and some change, a plumbing plan review, which goes to the Department of Labor of 2,272. And then we have a plan review the Department of Health needs to, um, needs to have, and that's um, a payment of 4,000. 800 so um, these payments are are due so we can continue our process mr chair yes yeah this 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 is an example of of situations that come up <clears throat> where when you're getting into a building project and there there can be decisions that need to be made uh, bef before a next board meeting from the simple fact that the timing can have all the difference in the world on whether something get the project is delayed or project has increased in prices that happen so rapidly uh, in this particular case the board has not yet given the authority for uh, in the case of, of Commissioner Mojo and I who serve on that where we've have that ability to pre-authorize certain things under those circumstances uh, but this this is an example of one of those things that uh, it, as Commissioner Mojo said early on we typically don't add items to the cons into a agenda addition that spends money without giving the public the awareness of it ahead of time. But this is a situation where uh, by delaying, it can be costly. So um, with that, and I don't know if Steve wants to report in his committees, but I think we, we do need to review um, that other piece of this about 
things that might come up in the future that on the, when the project starts going. So I, I, I would move forward. I would move this re, this request be approved. I'll second the motion. We got a motion by Kevin, a second by Jenny. To approve the motion to approve, uh, approve these plan reviews. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Okay. Approved. Thank you. May I make a comment? Yeah, go ahead. Before you leave, um, I'm going to get a little ahead of myself on a committee report, but I do want to thank both you in particular today uh, to Troy and our adult uh, mental health uh, locally advisory committee. He did a great presentation last uh, Tuesday, and I think uh, appreciate. I just think all those <clears throat> places were telling more people, you know, getting the word out about what the center is. You did a great job, and I think we had a very good discussion about withdrawal management and how that leads into next steps and, you know, into mental health, and you just did a great job. Thank you. I appreciate that. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Okay, with that, we'll take Matt to uh, request approval of the contract amendment number three to the Buffalo, Rid Buffalo River Flood Insurance Study. And that's been going on for a few years. Just a few years, Mr. Chair. Good morning. Good morning, Commissioners. Uh -huh. Yeah, so this is a request for. Uh, Contract amendment to a Buffalo River flood insurance study update that was initiated in um, 2017, um, essentially. And I have a, give me just a sec. I have a map so I can kind of show you the area that we're referring to. We do have the map as well in our pack. Oh, perfect. Um, so this is just from uh, just north of Glendon, south to just roughly past the um, the Buffalo Speedway. And so the kind of the original reason to do this update is is when um, our flood insurance rate maps were updated in, in 2008, there was an area or section of the Buffalo River that was not uh, included in that, and that resulted in um, an area that had some fairly inaccurate uh, flood insurance rate maps and that had an impact on people's um, flood insurance rates just due to um, elevations not being accurate. So um, in 2017, this board uh, approved a, um, a study to go and update those maps for this, for this area. And um, that's been going on Since, oh, let's see if I have it here. Since, since 2017, um, there was a contract amendment in 2018 and then a contract amendment in 2020 as well. There's been some, some challenges with just modeling this, this stretch of the Buffalo River is, is, is difficult. And we've also had some challenges uh, in working with uh, uh, reviewers um, from from FEMA on this. Uh, as of twenty late twenty or mid twenty twenty one into early twenty twenty two, we kind of thought that we had gotten to close to the finish line with this, and into the point where we actually sent out uh, landowner notices notifying them of this uh, of these changes. Um, and, and during that process, uh, we had a change in, in reviewers, and the new reviewer had, had some additional comments and requested some, some additional uh, uh, information um, on, on this study. And so kind of where we're at today is I'm uh, Greg Thielman from Houston Engineering, who's been working on this. Um, on our behalf is, is here with us, so he can, can answer any questions as well on some of the, maybe the more technical details. Um, but where we're at essentially is um, to, in order to address the, the concerns of the, the FEMA reviewer, uh, we would need an additional uh, $35,000 to complete the work. This project has been cost shared 50-50 with the Buffalo Red River Watershed District. And so they have cost shared the, the original contract 
and the two subsequent amendments to date. Um, I have reached out to them and they would be discussing if, if the, we were to approve this contract amendment, um, they would be discussing uh, continuing that cost share at their, their March 13th meeting. Um, and I should also note that um, we, because we received, or Houston had received um, these comments kind of the, roughly the end of January, so we have about 90 days from that time to address these comments. So Houston Engineering has already started the work to, to address these comments. So this, this work has already started to make sure that we can get um, these comments addressed and the new data that, that FEMA is requesting submitted in a timely fashion um, with at least maybe a month before that 90-day that deadline occurs so we can try and iron out any issues um, before then and so we're not pushing that deadline at all. So, so all this time, have the people in this area, do they have to pay higher insurance rates because we haven't finished this thing yet? Or are you aware Yes, of yep. So um, just looking at the initial, or not at the initial, but at when we had gotten to the point where we're gonna send, when we sent out these landowner notices, it looked like there was about 19 homeowners that would have been positively impacted um, by this in that they're, they were to be they were going to be removed from the floodplain. Um, there's still some homeowners that were going to be in the floodplain, but it's likely that the uh, the base flood elevations uh, for a lot of those properties could be lowered as well, which would they would still have to carry flood insurance, but their their rates could be could be lower as a result of that. So because of this misinformation, I, I guess it's misinformation that we started with at the beginning. There's no refund for them or anything. Or are you aware of anything like that? Or uh, no, I'm not aware of it, of any refund. They their rates are kind of based on on what the flood insurance rate maps um, say. Um, so yeah, they would be they would be tied to that. Okay. Go ahead. A question on that uh, follow up. And my experience with FEMA, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but um, once you get this done, uh, to Frank's point about premiums and that, it still takes about another year, does it not, uh, before P FEMA uh, takes care of any pre uh, rates, finalizes their rates. Maybe the, that's the best way I want to say it. I am not entirely sure about that. I don't have a good, good answer, but I would not be surprised right. by that. I, um, that's my experience, but I didn't know if, if you could speak to that or do you know? Yeah, or, Commissioner Krabenhoff, yeah. the, you know, once the maps go effective, there's always, you know, depending on when your renewal timeline is. But right. I, I think if the, the landowners are proactive, they can work with their agent and probably get some some relief on that, on the premiums that have been paid, at least for the, for the future. But anything that happened in the past obviously won't change that. Right. Okay. But it, it's, it's a long process yeah. for sure. And just knowing where this enters into the red, did does uh, uh, when the design changed so that 37 feet would go through town, did that affect any of the, any of this, or is it a net zero by the time it gets to that point? Do you understand? What yeah. I'm so, saying? Mr. Chair, my understanding is that with that um, with the diversion, that this would that would not have an impact on. Okay. It's on too this far north. Study. It's too far north. And okay, and I thought this is be. all in the kind of the Glendon area and upstream. So yeah, the Buffalo River Speedway it still so. would back up if it got. Right. Yeah, so this would be further yeah. upstream. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Yeah, I, you know I appreciate the update on the, on the numbers uh, that would come out. I think that's that's telling. Um, you mentioned about. There would still be some properties that would be in the floodplain, but the inundation might not be as as significant as as previously. Does the? It's been a while since I've worked with FEMA on the inundation piece since back in my days at Oakport, which is a long time ago. But so, are there different categories? So, would it would it be a different category that would allow the? flood insurance to be reduced? 
do you, do you understand my question? Yeah, so uh, Commissioner Campbell, there's essentially, depending on uh, your ba elevation relative to the, the base flood elevation, or I think Minnesota, the regulatory flood protection elevation, um, could would have an impact on, on the premium that you pay. Um, so if you are, uh, and they usually go by by feet, and and, and I would have to. I don't have that those numbers in front of me, and it's very it's dependent on on a unique homeowner's situation. Um, but relative to that to that base flood elevation, how far away from it or how close to it you are would impact your your insurance premiums. Yeah, well, the flooding also comes into play, and you know obviously this area was previously mapped based on the elevations in the Buffalo. Right. And now it's being modeled as a separate breakout corridor, which is why it gets so complicated. Okay. But, you know, so those elevations will generally go down, even though the, for the properties that are still in, so they may see some premium relief based on the new uh, risk rating 2.0, which is what FEMA uses to rate, rate insurance premiums. But the 19 would definitely see a benefit. Yeah, they, they would no longer be required to carry the mandatory insurance if they have a, a federally backed mortgage. And then they would be, their premiums would be based off of a zone X or a 500 year flood, which is okay. the, the reduced rate. Yeah. Some may still elect to purchase the flood insurance, even though they're, but, but it would be at a reduced rate. Yep. yep. Um, the 90 day period, when, when did that 90 day period start? I believe January 27th is my understanding is that that's when, that's when Houston had received the, the letter from from FEMA. The reason I ask that is, I, you know, I, the county has always taken the position in the past that, it, you know, that this is a worthy investment on behalf of the of our residents in that area, uh, but it also was based on a on a cost share with uh, the, the watershed district. And I see in your memo here that they're they're going to look they're going to consider it on the 13th. Uh, so I, you know, I guess I. You know, splitting that additional cost, I think, is still the appropriate way to go. And rather than having to come back here, what what would be our our best? Uh, would it be to uh, authorize this subject to Red River, you know, the Buffalo Red, approving it? And if they don't, what hap What happens then to the 90-day deal? Or yeah, um, Commissioner Campbell, I think um, the impacts there would be to the work that is currently ongoing as Houston Engineering, just recognizing that there is a, um, basically there's a, a deadline for when this work needs to get done and wanting to, to get it done in a timely fashion has already begun doing that work um, already. And so I think, you know, Delaying this decision might have an impact on our ability or on their ability to to get that work completed. Um, I think what ninety days from January twenty is got to be April, April something. So my um, I guess my point in my question was: Is Houston's already starting to do the the additional work in answering the question of, that FEMA's raised, in in being able to come to this final outcome? So. You know, at, at this point in time, um, Mr. Chair, based on what I've heard today, uh, I, w I would move that we authorize um, uh, payment of half of the additional cost on this um, answer to FEMA that's before us today. I'll second that, and then I have a question for discussion. So uh, what's that? So that's again about uh, what seventeen five on our part. It's thirty five thousand, right? Thirty five thousand six. Correct. Okay. So one half of the thirty five thousand sixty six yep. dollars. So yeah, and then uh, so roughly seventeen five. Um, also, I want to uh, thank you, and I guess for right now forty five thousand. <laughs> that helps. Right. <laughs> but. Uh, um, yeah, it's unfortunate it, uh, these things happen. But. but I, you know, and so that 17 that we're paying, that, that allows them to keep moving forward right now, and then hopefully the Buffalo Red will yeah. will then authorize the second half of that. Right, correct. 
for me very much. Yeah, and the, the risk at the 90 days is if we get past the 90 days and we don't respond, then they can close the case and then to initiate it again, you're essentially starting over. And, mm -hmm. and we've been struggling with them to get clarification on what it, they really need to address the comments. So that's kind of why there's been so much back and forth. And I think, I don't know if we have a, we have a pretty long timeline here of all our communications with them, but um, we're, we've just been trying to keep it from, so the case doesn't close, because then you got to start over and, and that's not in any of our best interest. <laughs> But, and again, I, Greg, you've done an awful lot of work dealing with FEMA and, and remapping floodplains throughout this area. Are, are you confident that, you know, the questions that they've submitted based on the previous application process, that this will answer those questions? Yes, we are, and we've engaged the DNR floodplain staff because they also need to sign off on it, and we've made sure that they're on board with the approach going forward to try to, we actually tried to see if they could just kind of <laughs> convince them to go back to what they had already agreed on, but they didn't have any luck with that. But um, we've been collaborating with both the reviewer and, and the DNR to try to get things lined up here so that we can get to the end. Okay. Thank you. Hey, Mr. Chair, can I just ask for a, a point of clarification on the on the motion? So the motion would be for to authorize the 17,500 or half the, half the I, my, my, mo my motion is for Clay County to pay for half of the additional $35,066 that's in this document. My only question is that the Buffalo Red doesn't have a contract with, with FEMA at all, so I'm just wondering how that would that would work. That's a good point of clarification because I, if I recall- or a contract with Houston, sorry. Six years ago, we were the ones that took the lead on the project and went to Bruce Albright and said, would the Buffalo Red be interested in cost sharing this, knowing that the contract is with Clay County, the reimbursements come to Clay County from the watershed? Yep. Yeah. So I guess maybe, I hate uh, wordsmithing people. I, I guess from, from my standpoint, the motion that I've made will certainly cover some costs that would go up until this March 13th time. And then if, if the Buffalo Red uh, were determined, obviously if, if the full amount is under contract with Clay County, then we can go back and, you know, I just don't know what do we, what do we, I think, I think that Buffalo Red should be doing this, paying half of this. Well, that's why I'm, I'm. Uh, I, I agree. I don't think any of us are implying that they're not open to doing that. I just right. think for clarity's sake, we should make the motion to approve it pending the fact that the Buffalo Red will cost share 50%. Yeah. Well, I, my, my motion is on there for us to, to pay half and, and that keeps it going. And if, if the, after the Buffalo Red says yes, they will agree, then this board then could would still probably based on what you're saying, Matt. This board would still have to make the resolution to, to for the second half, that would then be reimbursed yep. by the watershed. Correct. So I would be happy to come back after that March 13th date for the for the remaining half of that, if that makes sense. Yeah, I, it, it allows somebody to go to the Buffalo Red board and say, well. The county has agreed to pay the 17 half of the cost. Well, wouldn't we be responsible for the whole 35,000 and hope to get half of it from the Buffalo Red? Wouldn't we have to approve? That the still is the intent. Yeah, I know that's the intent, but we would be responsible for the 35,000, whether the Buffalo Red participates or not, wouldn't we? That's, that's how I was. Uh, yeah, Mr. Chair, if. They, that's that would be the cost. Thirty-five thousand is what it would cost to complete complete the work. Right. So if the Buffalo Red decides not to continue to cost share on this project, and we only paid this seventeen half of that, then we wouldn't be able to complete the work. I say I think we have to approve it for thirty-five. But Ed Paul, well. You're saying we're going to approve the 35, but Jenny made a comment that uh, pending, 
And my understanding, if we pin, that kind of puts you in a bad spot again. You're saying that would delay or not? Or am I misinterpreting what you mean by uh, pending? I guess from my, per my perspective is we as a board need to decide, do we want the project done? Yeah. We know how much it's going to cost. The reality is the Buffalo Red has been good partners with us, but there is also a chance that they decide not to. And so there, it is likely that we're on the hook for the full amount. I'm trying to expedite the process knowing that a week of non-response, if you look at this, this history, they kind of do it whenever they want to. So however we can expedite the process to save the money, maybe that means it, a, approving the whole amendment to request today and then, and then presenting to the Buffalo Red. I don't, I don't know. I, I think we're so messed up with what the, I think there's a motion and a second on the table. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. And again, I, my motion is to pay seven, half of the cost and, and then allow Buffalo Red to do what they've done in the, you know, do what they've done in the past and, and pay the other half. And that isn't to say that if, if they turn around and they decide they're not going to do it, then there still is time for us to, I just think it, the, the, the motion that we have suggests to them that they should be paying the other half. If we simply say, well, we're going to make a motion to do the whole, to pay the whole thing, you know, I, I don't know, I, I stand by my motion, I guess. Okay, yeah, Mr. Chair and Commissioner, I think that would make sense then then after the March meeting say the Buffalo red approved that cost share um, then we would be good if they didn't then I would probably be coming back and requesting that it did. well you, you'll come back either way either way yeah okay did you have any comments to Steve or Brian uh, no I was just going to say that we would need Matt to come back in order to pay the full amount we would be getting the reimbursement so we would have to qualify the 35,000 uh, for paying. Okay. That could take 30 seconds of a board meeting. <laughs> well, and I'm just going to clarify that I'm going to vote against the motion that stands because I'm not going to be present that week and a half after that. So um, I would prefer that, um, depending on whatever the motion does, that we approve the full request just to save you a trip knowing that we have folks that might be out. So, um, but there's a motion and a second on the table. Okay, just so I'm clear on this, we are making a motion for the 17,000, if the Buffalo Red doesn't come forward with the other half, we'll have to come back and That's right. bring another 17,000. That's right. Um, we've got a motion and a second on that. Okay. Clarification, it's half, it's a little over 17,000. Half whatever of it is. the 35, or half, half of the amount. Yeah, is the motion, so. Okay. Yep. All right, any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Okay. Passes three to one. Thank you. Thank you. And I could, if I could, Mr. Chair, I'd just like to thank Greg for all of his work. Yes. Uh, in in uh, in keeping the communication lines open with the county throughout the years, uh, and and continually prodding the DNR to to move this forward. So thank you. Oh, thank you. It's been a it's been a challenging project. <laughs> Greg, isn't it crazy to think that they could build the diversion in less time than it takes to get the study figured out? <laughs> it is. We have a, we're redoing the floodplain up in Minot, North Dakota, and that project started in 2007, and it's still going. So when it's, did we start this one, the Buffalo Red study? When did we start that? 2017, October 2017, yeah. I think it's unfortunate these people have to pay higher rates because... Yeah. Yep time it takes to get mm -hmm. study done you know just which is really i mean we started this study based on hearing from residents there were some major issues that had bubbled up there and it's unfortunate yeah thank you okay okay with that we'll go into committee reports jenny you want to start us out today sure mr chair I had a lot of meetings last week, so for the sake of time, I'll try to abbreviate. 
Last Tuesday, I attended the Red River Watershed Management Board joint conference with the Red River Basin Flood Damage Reduction. Uh, that was at the Marriott in Fargo, or Marriott in Moorhead. Uh, we did have an update from Extension on their coolest drainage plots in Crookston and talked about uh, impoundment cattail management, which was really quite an interesting presentation. And then talked about Section 4 of the Clear Clean Water Act, the review of pers proposed stream impacts and compensatory stream mitigation requirements. And then also had an update on soil health in northern climates. That, uh, that evening, I attended the Planning Commission meeting. We had one interim use permit up for discussion, a temporary second dwelling application in Flowing Township. Uh, really an application that fit within the reason we allow those temporary second dwellings, and that did pass. We discussed penalties for permit violations. Uh, the board really did continue to have the thought process that being fair and flexible with our landowners for those issues was the best policy, understanding there are some frequent violators and maybe there needed to be stiffer penalties for them, but no uh, formal action was taken on that. We did have board elections. Uh, Mr. Bayer was elected chair again for that. He serves in that capacity well. Wednesday, I attended the second day of the Red River Watershed Management Plan Joint Conference. Um, had um, updates from the Red Board on their projects for 2022. We talked about the Mud River Enhancement Project and the Buffalo Red gave an update of their South Branch Buffalo River Restoration Project and then updates from the Flood Damage Reduction Work Group over the last year that the group hasn't been as active in the past few years, hoping to increase their involvement and activity going forward. I attended the second half of the virtual AMC legislative conference at the um, government center with all of you. Appreciate the opportunity to attend that even though we couldn't attend in person. Uh, I think AMC did a really great job to in a quick amount of time, gather all of the um, parties to attend that virtually. So I'm glad we were able to do that. Did have a legislative priorities briefing and um, with 3000 bills that have been submitted, uh, there's a lot on the table for counties. And so AMC has done a great job of, of um, sorting through that with their government relationship or relations team. The board had updates from, or meetings rather, uh, with Representative Joy, Representative Keel, and Senator Johnson. We appreciate the three of them making, carving out uh, really generous time out of their schedules to meet with us as Representative Keel and Senator Johnson were added to our district with the redistricting, offered the first opportunity for this full board to talk with them and they were really aware of issues relating to Clay County, and so we appreciate their um, uh, their time and ability to champion issues for us. We then had uh, updates from meetings, rather, with the Department of Natural Resources. Commissioner Strauman and her team were available uh, for a half-hour meeting with us and also had an update from the newly appointed Commissioner of Revenue, Commissioner Mark Wart, uh, who has always been such a great champion for uh, rural Minnesota and counties, uh, continue to um, watch what's happening with the DNR, or D Department of Revenue. I did see yesterday the um, surplus has um, balanced at 17 billion, so we'll see going forward what comes out of that. And then Thursday, I attended the Extension Committee meeting. Uh, we did have board elections. I was uh, voted to be chair of that board again. An update from the University of Minnesota Extension, Dean Durgan. They saw a 57% increase in 20, from 2021 in 4-H youth involved, enrolled. A 57% increase brought it to 40,516 youth statewide that are enrolled in extension 4-H programs. That's amazing. We had report backs on meetings from the regional operator officers and county administrators 
really making sure that we're having collaboration in um, in general um, business and how if the counties are closing for snow days or other issues, making sure we're coordinating with them. And I think we've laid out a, a path forward for Clay County to do that with that regional office. And then there were two county community leadership awards from 4-H clubs in Cottonwood and Candeo High Counties. Congratulations to them, great work. Thursday afternoon, I had the MCC JPA meeting. We did have the property updates that are included on the MCC JPA page, and then year-end summaries for Pfeiffer's, who is managing the, the land that has been purchased for that group, and then had a long discussion on future bonding requests and communicating the best avenue forward for that. Friday, I had a conversation with a Moorhead State University Moorhead student. Uh, she's working on a women's studies project and needed to interview an elected official. Monday, I attended the Lakeland Mental Health Center annual board meeting. That board continues to be in strong financial um, standing. I brought back an annual report for all of you. You can work through that as you wish. We continue to offer um, mold and offer collaborative services to really best fit the needs of the general communities. Those mental health services have really increased. As you can see, there's hundreds of thousands of hours of therapy that was provided for the agency in 2022. We had a reappointment of four terms, two county commissioners and two layperson. And then after that, we had the board, the regular board meeting we had a uh, election of officers and someone drew the short straw again and now uh, the chair of that board will be myself for the next year. And then um, I had a really long discussion on legislative issues. As you know, we've talked about the paid family leave um, uh, bill that is uh, likely to pass. Lakeland has some significant issues, um, concerns with that because of the fact that the people that they hire have, um, one, it's been really difficult to hire people as it is, but two, because of um, um, licensure. Currently, Clay County or the Moorhead site is seeing a two-day delay in um, the time that they've been people have been referred to a therapist or a psychiatry appointment. With a one, um, with the agency being down one position, that number changes from two days to a 45-day lead for people to have a psychiatry appointment. So if you've ever dealt with someone in crisis, making sure that they're able to see someone as soon as possible, that's really um, important. Um, having a two, um, over a month lead or delay on that was really scary. And knowing that that would likely not just affect one provider, they have some concerns on that. Obviously knowing there's nothing really they can do with it, um, but just so the community knows that could um, be something that we will experience. I attended the Lakes and Prairies Community Action Board meeting last night as well. We welcomed our new board meet, our board member, Commissioner Krabenoft. We had a communications program update from Amanda Even. She's doing a really great job there, making sure that they're um, getting the information of the agency out as soon as possible. Last uh, month, we had at Giving Hearts Day, they were able to raise $20,175, which is a very large increase from the prior year. So great job there. And then had um, some updates to the bylaws. We continue to update those to make sure they're as um, relevant as possible and had a update from the executive director on issues within the agency. That concludes my reports. Okay. Thank you, and congratulations to your two new appointments there. Thank you, Commissioner Gross. <laughs> Kevin. Thank you. On Tuesday, February 21st, I attended the virtual AMC legislative conference due to weather. Uh, we did hear in the morning, we did hear from Governor Walsh who talked about um, 
certainly most of his discussion was about an AMC platforms and how he, you know, um, wants to work together with with us on that. Uh, we had an update, or we had a state of the county's address from AMC President Mary Jo McGuire. And then in the afternoon, we or later that morning, we did have some uh, local discussions with our legislatures, as uh, Commissioner Mojo had talked about with uh, Deb Keel and Jim Joy and, and Senator Mark Johnson, um, Senator Rob Kupek and, and Representative Heather Keeler were unavailable to meet with us at that time. Uh, the items of significance that we wanted to talk about with them obviously was uh, the increase in um, county program aid. That's that's a something that's really big uh, for Clay County and every one of our um, residents and businesses in, in Clay County benefit from increased pro county program aid. So other issues, House File 669, which was a $10 million in additional um, money to develop um, behavioral health crisis facilities. You know, as you know, we're in the process of working on one. Those additional dollars would be available for us to probably at least to compete for with the ability to go towards that, that facility or expand that facility for the needs that have been expressed in the past by both Rhonda uh, from social services and with Kathy McKay with public health. So there, that's, that's a good thing in that deal. The score funding, there's a House file 1785 and Senate file 1587. There seems to be a lot of bipartisan support in that. That's the solid waste management tax that's collected that currently 30% currently goes into the general fund and we've been wanting that to go back into the environmental fund which then ultimately returns to us in in score dollars and as I expressed to them just for Clay County if that happens uh, that would double the amount of score funding that we get on an annual basis from about 185 to 200 thousand dollars up upwards to 400 thousand dollars so it's a significant uh, uh, that would be a significant benefit to Clay County if that were to to pass uh, house file 1395 um, that one exempts counties from having to pay le tax levy dollars for clients who are committed uh, as mentally mentally ill and that are dangerous to the public. That is that is a situation where I don't know maybe uh, you know certainly uh, our county attorney knows that that if if that happens right now we can we can be paying uh, Steve if you can help me out here as much as twenty four hundred dollars a day. Uh, in for costs for those types of things. So this would be real that would be a really beneficial one for us as well. Uh, then there was also House File 1234, which deals with the post-traumatic distress disorder, disorder and, and that a lot of that is happening right now within law enforcement. So there's um, that's being talked about in public safety and that's one of very interest to us as well. On February the 23rd, uh, we had a MCC JPA meeting. Uh, Commissioner Mojo gave an update on that. Um, we we are talking about uh, re uh, bonding requests in the future and the strategies to do that. We are going to continue that meeting into today to, to go over that working along with the city of Morad and what is the best strategy moving forward to, you know, that also fulfills our commitment as a member of the Diversion Authority for requesting state funding. Uh, that afternoon, we had a Diversion Authority meeting, and that one was several things that were done there. We, we, did, we do get some of the same land agent reports or, or property acquisition reports. Uh, probably the biggest topic of discussion on that particular day is there is still an interest in in having some um, recreational grant research funding going on. There's a belief that there's a real there's some potential real, real recreational opportunities along that project. 
but within the project right now there is no funding for any recreational activities that go on and so um, it was, was uh, suggested and recommended a, that that go before the new diversion planning commission group planning board to come up with different entities that can help establish what would be what would a recreational project look like what what are things that could be done um, and I, we certainly don't I uh, think the um, there's been some previous work done on that by Metro Cog and it did a significant study on that so there's an awful lot of good information there that they'll go back and look on and I believe that concludes my report yes Sorry, I did forget to report on my Environment and Natural Resources Committee meeting. That was Thursday as well. We had a um, long discussion with Bowser, um, had John Jaschke and DNR uh, Commissioner Strawman, and then the MPCA uh, Commissioner Kessler as well was part of that. We did talk a long time about our priority for the SCORE, Solid Waste Management Tax, and talk about the sustainability to PILT payments. Uh, throughout the years and so a lot there's a lot of, to cover but um, certainly appreciate their time on that and then the other piece is uh, with the chamber legislative group I'd been um, planning on going to St. Paul tomorrow for their legislative day at the hill due to the weather I'm not able to go so I, I know that you have um, a conflict and are not able to but we do have um, um, the option to participate if any of you were able to go to St. Paul, but I, I'm not sure if yeah. you are. Thank you. Oh. Thank you. Um, yeah, busy week also. Um, I, I won't add too much more about, so on uh, Tuesday the 21st, I um, had the Adult Mental Health Local Advisory Council meeting. I mentioned that earlier, and again, that's why I pointed out uh, Troy Amundsen with our, uh, uh, who is working with the, uh, with our uh, substance use um, crisis uh, center. And great discussion on that. And I think what was getting the information across is that this is a short term acute withdrawal center. And so we had a longer discussion after that. What are those next steps? looking like afterwards and and again we'll work with public health health on that and uh, but it was a good discussion with about let's say there was probably 25 30 people there so it was very good um again <clears throat> as with the others of our commission here i was part of the uh, virtual uh, legislative um, presentation that amc put on um, uh, mainly on uh, wednesday and thursday uh, Wednesday, you, you covered that very well, both uh, uh, Commissioner Mojo and, and um, Commissioner Campbell. I really don't have anything to add um, uh, other than I want to make sure I'll do my uh, full disclosure here. Um, uh, as mentioned before in earlier meetings, I'm part of the uh, Legislative Salary Council, which prescribes uh, legislative salaries. And I wasn't, I'm not allowed to have any contact with any legislator until March 31st. So I just want to make sure I'm disclosing to everybody that I was, while I was part of the full board for general discussions with that legislative staff, I was not part of any legislative virtual vis visit that we had. So just want to point that out. Um, the next day, uh, as being part of Health and Human Services, uh, we had our uh, policy committee uh, discussions uh, really uh, around legislative issues are mainly about uh, un, um, which human services, uh, the shortage that's occurred over the years, the unfunded mandates, let's put it that way, that are put on our social service systems. Um, I trust uh, in uh, listening to the governor and some of the uh, bills that we see initiating um, coming through that there is going to be hopefully some significant progress toward that. Um, when it comes to the county program aid, um, uh, I'm very 
hopeful. Uh, I think the governor's uh, a little light on it, but hopefully the, uh, the House and the Senate will pull those numbers up to uh, help us directly. Uh, but in any event, whether it, um, all those things help to uh, lower our tax, or keep our tax levy as low as it can be. Um, yeah, and as for the other the other piece, I guess I'll mention a little bit uh, about um, uh, with the health and human services as part of what I'm doing along with public health here uh, locally. Again, it comes back to the opioid settlement and uh, work being done with that and how to use that money most effectively and then also uh, carrying in our policy, trying to work with uh, best we can with family first. Uh, and uh, community resource centers. So that development is all to come. I don't have any specific bills to point out yet, uh, but know that uh, AMC and others are putting things in motion there. So it was good to be part of that legislative group. Um, then on Friday, the 24th, uh, so uh, last month I was, uh, 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 elected to the board of uh, CAP-LP, uh, Community a a <coughs> Action Partners, uh, and Lakes and Prairie. I had a, about a two and a half hour orientation with their executive director, Laurie Swartz. Uh, it's very good. And, and I just made a comment, uh, maybe this is, uh, uh, this board knows it well because of uh, past, but for me it was, uh, uh, you know, is a uh, you know a mission statement. There it is. It reads: uh, We eliminate poverty by empowering families and engaging communities. So we had a deep dive, dive among that theme. Uh, also, the fact that uh, you know how uh, you know a community action partnership came around in the 1964 Act uh, with Lyndon Johnson, and that was the start of Head Start. So. For me, that was uh, learning some things, and certainly over, uh, so that, uh, and then she had the history how it came to Clay County in the mid-60s, right after we got started, and and now it's it developed into quite a uh, nonprofit organization here, and uh, so that moved into, last night, along with uh, Commissioner Mojo, I attended my first uh, board meeting. So uh, I'm not gonna repeat a lot, uh, what uh, Commissioner Mojo uh, mentioned, but we are reviewing the the uh, bylaws, making sure that we can do things as efficiently as possible in our meeting form, and then also we approved their an annual budget. So, um, and then also yesterday morning, uh, I went down to Fergus, and I know Commissioner Gross was on online also. I was part of the annual meeting for the Lakeland Mental Health. Uh, that was a uh, good background for me. Again, meeting some uh, new people and uh, actually one, uh, um, uh, one commissioner I'd gotten to know at the uh, um, commission, AMC Commissioner 101 uh, from Pope uh, County. So it was good to see him again. And then yesterday afternoon, I uh, uh, threw an invite through the um, uh, Cass Clay um, Food Commission. Uh, I am now part of the uh, steering committee, and so we spent uh, geez, it was an hour and a half, almost two hours. And I just uh, uh, just a couple items on that real quickly. Um, they started this morning. Uh, uh, Commissioner uh, Fargo Commissioner uh, Arlette Preston is leading this. Uh, she was at twenty below this morning and uh, they call it Coffee with Food Commission, and it's a way of inviting this bigger umbrella, if you will, of the uh, Cascade Food Par Partners, Food of the North, other organizations, come together with, uh, just to get a uh, networking event and you know, uh, talk, discuss items uh, in the way of um, <coughs> food needs and, and food distribution, those type things. Um, uh, the next one will be on April 12th, and I'll, I'll be the host of that for uh, Clay County. And uh, we're going to uh, be finding a spot in Dilworth, Frank. <laughs> so uh, that's where I'll host that. Again, that'll be on the uh, 12th at 4 o'clock. We'll have more about that when it comes. Long discussion about backyard chickens. 
So um, um, Moorhead's uh, doing a workshop on it right now. Fargo's in uh, well into their ordinance. They're writing. West Fargo's just starting to think about it. And um, I, I wanted to ask you, Commissioner Gross, uh, do, what's in Dilworth? Do they have an ordinance or are they talking about it? Do you know? Not that I'm aware of. Okay. I was just kind of curious. And they've got a request, yeah. yeah. Okay. Very good. So we'll see how those things come. And um, uh, yeah, just so the public knows, I'm fully in support of it. But uh, um, yeah, it was a very good meeting. Um, met some uh, people that I knew from uh, other uh, salt and water business that I used to do with. So it was fun to get reengaged. And uh, um, uh, on March 8th will be the Casterly um, uh, Food Commission meeting, which I will be uh, out of town for, but uh, hopefully some others of this of our commission will be able to make meet the, make that meeting. So that, that's what I have today. Okay, thank you all. In the meetings I had was last Tuesday, I, the Minnesota Rural Counties uh, meeting on Tuesday evening. Um, I think our new lobbyist for that, um, Mr. Larson retired from that or resigned from that. We got Capitol Hill now, and I think they're really doing a great job in representing the Minnesota rural counties. And um, they had a good meeting there. They, um, some of the things they talked about was, that, well, Governor Walls, I guess he's uh, introducing his, or wants an increase of 30 million for CPA and LPA, so LGA. Uh, so that would help us out a little bit and getting some extra money there. Um, Talked a lot about the, the drainage situation. I don't think we've got too much problem in the in the Clay County, but some of the other counties are having a big problem with the drainage situation. Um, they talked about solid waste, taking the cut of the taxes, you know, trying to eliminate that. I think they're getting 30% of the taxes for solid waste, and they're trying to get eliminate that going to the general fund. Um, a lot of talk about child care facility funding and... Uh, uh, we, then we had the representative Matt Norris was there, and he talked about the attorneys are looking at adding seven new attorneys to the attorney's office. Representative Horstein was there, talked about the gas tax not looking very reliable, or and also the metro. There's going to looking at a metro tra transit tax going on down in the in the metro area. Uh, Representative Torkelson also talked about the clean energy bill, nursing homes, and traveling nurses. You know and a lot of discussion was held on that. Uh, uh, Wednesday, we had that, uh, which has been discussed by everybody else, about the meeting with our representatives. Um, uh, Thursday morning, I had the general government meeting. Um, the discussion was also held. Pretty much the same stuff was covered again on rental assistance, uh, down, pay down payment assi assistance, uh, Minnesota Coalition for the Coalition for the Homeless, the Pathway Home Act. Uh, um, they talked about the 100 million for that the, for shelter. I mean for for shelter, for emergency services. They talked about 40 million, 25 million for homeless youth, 9 million for transitional housing, 2 million for homeless youth, and 1.25 million for homeless management. I think they're going to use up that 17 billion in a hurry by the time they get all these. Bills passed if they all pass. So, um, I had a shack meeting Friday morning. Um, pretty much same discussion again uh, concerning recruitment of nursing nurses, which is a problem all over again. They talked about the suicide and the crisis lifeline, um, and um, I guess that's pretty much what we covered there. And I guess Monday morning, I yesterday morning I attended um, the um, Lakeland Mental Health Association. I was surprised at the number of clients. You know, they talked about 8,158 clients that they helped in 2022 and 123,400 services in 2022. I mean, that's a whole bunch of people being served in these in this county area that uh, Lakeland Health covers. That you know, sometimes you don't realize if you only attend a meeting once a year, you know, what, what that company does, you know, or not company or agency does. And it, it really surprised me of all the people that they're helping out in this area. That's very impressed with that. 
Um, that's my report. Uh, Steve. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, last uh, Wednesday and Thursday, I participated in the AMC Legislative Conference. That's been well covered. Uh, I did jump around to your different policy committees. I think one area that, that was of interest, uh, there was a gentleman having the discussion on how many of the counties are being challenged with fire protection and EMS, especially in the rural areas. Uh, and so that was a good discussion. Uh, if you recall back at our intergovernmental retreat when we provided our update, uh, we uh, shared uh, some of our building projects throughout the years and, and discussed the upcoming substance use facility and potential mental health uh, wing that would allow for future expansion. Uh, and at that meeting, we were approached, uh, approached by the outreach uh, uh, director for Tina Smith. Uh, he had uh, shared that there would be uh, congressional spend, direct spending requests uh, coming out here shortly. Uh, those requests did come out. We were notified both by Senator Klobuchar and Senator Smith. Uh, this past week, uh, we met with Mr. Melton, uh, Kathy McKay, Troy Amundsen, Rhonda Porter, uh, Kirsten Lepard, uh, and processed uh, what that could potentially look like uh, for the county. Uh, based on uh, kind of looking over the application process, uh, the mental health component, uh, that piece probably didn't have enough uh, parts to that yet to be able to make any sort of request, but our substance use uh, facility uh, did appear to, to uh, fit the criteria established. And so uh, I believe uh, right now, uh, Troy and Kathy have been working on that and will be coming before this board next week to request uh, permission to uh, submit for those the grant process. On the 23rd, I participated uh, MCC JPA meeting, which has been well covered. Uh, I would note that uh, Joel Paulson mentioned at the meeting that, again, the project is on time and on budget at this point, and then shared how they've continued to work on the, on the trench throughout uh, the winter, even given the, the challenging conditions that we've had. Uh, on the 24th, I met with Joel Olson in regards to risk management and fleet, fleet management. Uh, I think we've had some discussions over the last couple board meetings about the importance of making sure our MT, MCIT schedules are up to date from our departments. But uh, risk management is uh, even more than that, and data, computers, uh, information from HR, uh, and and so I think that uh, working with uh, working with Joe through our management piece and Rory Schmitz uh, to bring forward uh, here in the coming months uh, a complete risk management uh, pro program for your consideration. Um, uh, 27th, I met uh, with Darren on a series of HR issues that afternoon. Also met with uh, Troy and Kathy again in regards to the congressional spending option opportunity. Uh, would uh, just note, uh, uh, in working with Mr. Melton and Mr. Leeser, we did uh, send a uh, amended uh, amended lease contract uh, to Roars for their consideration uh, in regards to the DMV. Uh, we'll keep the board updated as we hear more information on that. Uh, you uh, all have, uh, may have received this morning uh, your invitation uh, from the Clay County Association of Township Officers. That's going to be held March 20th. Uh, just a chain note, the change of location is going to be at our resource recovery facility. Uh, and so uh, we will make sure that we get that advertised for the boards uh, to be able to attend to that. And, and then also just uh, be sending emails out uh, with, uh, to you guys to look at your availability uh, to set up our rural our rural cities meeting uh, for the spring, and with that, it concludes my report. Okay, Mr. Melton, you got anything? No, thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, Jackie, all set. Okay, we're adjourned. <laughs>